Excellent, excellent, excellent. Wow, we are coming from all over today. This is great. Delaware, Buffalo, Ohio. St. Louis, excellent. Excellent, excellent. Okay, well, um, Jenna, is there anything you need to say before we get started in terms of like tech issues or logistics? Okay, so Jenna is here for, with me from ACES Connection. She's our tech host. Um, she'll unmute you um, if you wanna share. And um, otherwise you're all uh, muted and I'm going to introduce our once. I'm so excited for our guest speaker today. So uh, Roberto Rivera is a friend and colleague who also happens to live in my hometown of Madison, Wisconsin. So, um, and he is going to tell you a little bit more about what he does. But our focus today, if you remember, we've been framing all these conversations around um, the six pillars of trauma-informed care and trying to weave <clears throat> the different topic areas uh, through that framework because that's what we want to do in our schools as well as use that as kind of our guiding umbrella but weave everything else that we do um, through it and uh, Roberto has spent most of his time working around youth and youth voice and I think that's a critical component to to this work right and if we think about empowerment and trust and safety and you know peer support and awareness of cultural and historical and gender issues, we can weave the importance of youth voice through all of those pillars. So that's really what I want you to keep in mind today as we continue um, this journey. All right, um, Roberto, can you unmute yourself or does Jenna need to unmute you? All right. I'm here. You're good. Go ahead. Well, I just want to uh, thank you, Laura, for uh, inviting me to be a part of this conversation. <laughs> Uh, was able to catch a lot of the conversation with Ingrid, and it was, uh, you know, revitalizing, it was refreshing, and I'm excited to be part of this, wow, national, international mix of folks redefining the new normal. So thanks again. Uh, uh, as Laura suggested, I'm going to be talking about youth voice, and I'm really passionate about this topic uh, for a number of reasons. One reason being that uh, someone took a chance on me as a teenager to become a program director of a teen center. And I remember people used to come in and they'd say, yes, I'd like to talk to the adult in charge. And I'd be like, <clears throat> well, I am the adult in charge, you know? And so for me, that was really a transformative experience uh, in a number of ways. But I've come to really understand that in order to have authentic voice, for young folks, it also requires adults to make the conscientious decision to not become old people, but to become elders to these youth, right? And I wanna make a quick distinction between old people and elders. So old people oftentimes see young folks as being part of the problem. Uh, they don't have the, the proper lenses in seeing young folks because when they see them, they just see a bunch of deficits in these young folks. And when it comes time to really taking action, old people will play the background, right? Whereas elders see young people as having the capability of being part of the solution. Elders can see the assets in young folks. And when it comes time to taking action, elders will lock arms with our young people and help them to walk this thing out, right? And so it's critically important is we're kind of conceptualizing this notion of youth voice to really understand that youth voice is nurtured in the context of elders and eldership, right? And I believe that a really powerful thing can actually happen when we take the wisdom and the experience of elders and we combine it with the energy, the innovation and the swagger of the youth. Those two things coming together allows for some real transformation to happen. And so for me, uh, being in this position of being 19 years old, uh, running these, this teen center, I was caught up in the, in the whirlwind of being this uh, reciprocally transformative experience. And the elder to me is a young person who's an elder, because how many of us know you can, you can be an, an elder and still be a young person. And actually, before I go any further, I want to share a definition of youth voice that I came across 
that's actually uh, defined by youth. And so this is documented in some of the work of Dr. Ernest Morell and uh, his work with uh, youth doing youth participatory action research. So here's a definition of youth voice from youth. An expression of the human spirit that is shown in different forms such as art, words, poetry, and music. Engaging in the creation of your own opportunities to speak out to authority. Believing and putting our voices into practice so youth can be taken seriously. Now I know there's a lot of different concepts there, but give me uh, uh, some spirit fingers or thumbs up if you're seeing that there's a need for an environment of trust or transparency for this to emerge. If there's a need for safety, whether it be uh, physical or psychological, and I think this is an easy one, do you see any uh, essence of empowerment going on in this definition? Any thumbs up? What about awareness of cultural and historical issues? So absolutely, I think uh, definitely youth voice is deeply interconnected to a lot of this trauma-informed work. And so for me, being in this sort of environment of elders and, and, and youth finding this kind of voice, it was reciprocally transformative, not just to the youth who were coming in, but also to me. It took someone who formerly was told I was learning deficient. I was uh, put in special education classes as a young person. Um, you know, I had some misdirected entrepreneurship going on in my younger years, which got me kicked out of middle school. Uh, I went to 13 different schools before I entered high school, which is different family issues going on. Uh, took the ACEs test not that long ago and saw that I have eight out of 10 ACEs, right? And never could conceptualize ever, you know, graduating from high school, let alone going to college. And so the other side of that coin of my life is that I realized, well, I'm not learning deficient. I'm LD. I learn differently, right? And instead of just looking at the deficits, I started realizing I have different assets in my life that I can, you know, unearth and I can start to cultivate. And so I ended up not only graduating from high school, but I'm going from LD to, to PhD. I'm wrapping up my PhD right now, working on my dissertation. And so being in a space with these youth, you know, we started asking a different series of questions in this teen center that we continue to ask to this day. And the question was not, you know, what's wrong with you or even what's happened to you, but what assets do you have? What are you good at? What are the things that, that make you, you know, uh, come alive? And for a lot of our youth in the Midwest, a lot of them were into hip hop. So they're into dancing, they're into graffiti, they're into making beats and doing poetry. And so, it became very natural for us to invite other more seasoned artists to come in and mentor these youth. And what started out as workshops evolved to us doing concerts, to doing festivals, to doing full blown hip hop theatrical productions, getting invited to go to the Kennedy Center. And so I think, you know, Lynn Miranda, you know, he might owe us a little bit of money because we were doing this Hamilton thing like for a while now, right? I saw they just uh, gonna be releasing a movie of Hamilton on Disney Plus. And so I don't know, we'll see about that royalty check. I'll let you know, Laura, if we end up making a donation from Disney Plus uh, to ACES Connection. But one of the interesting things that was happening was on one hand, our youth are speaking at conferences with Congress people. They're opening up you know, for international hip hop artists who are coming into town but then they're having a very different experience at school. They're telling us that, you know, they're disproportionately being singled out and disciplined. They're being put in these special education classes. They're being told that they're part of the problem and that they're stupid. And we're like, well, what the heck? You know, you guys are, are amazing. You, you know, are keynote speaking these conferences. So we realized what we were doing in after school, that there was something that we needed to bring from that space into the school space. So we ended up getting a little bit of funding and putting together a curriculum that we could facilitate during the school day. And I remember we met with the superintendent and he had, you know, one particular school in mind, which he said was the worst school 
in the district and they've tried every intervention under the sun. And he said, we might as well try this hip hoppity stuff that you're talking about. So with his blessing, we end up going into the high school um, and we meet with some of the uh, principals and assistant principals. And they let us know that 80% of the issues in the school are coming from like 20% of the youth. Anybody can identify with that, a very small population, maybe causing some of the disruptions and so forth. And so when we went down to house two, you know, the further we got down the hall, it seemed like the lights started getting more dim and flickering and everything. And we quickly learned that this is where they were warehousing a lot of their black and brown youth of color, you know, with different labels from EBD to ODD to LD to ADHD to XYZ. I don't know, some maybe we're down with OPP too. But what we realize is that they have been, um, there's been so many interventions trying to come fix them that that was the last thing that they needed. So our approach was not to bring another intervention or even prevention. What these young folks felt we felt needed was invention to totally reinvent themselves, right? To go from seeing themselves as deficits to assets. So long story short, we ended up doing an all school assembly and really framing this programming in a way that was strength based. Brought in different hip hop artists. We said this is a leadership program and you know, who wants to be involved with it? So many of the youth came up and they're signing up and the whole school wants to be a part of this leadership program. And we end up going to house two to these young folks who you know, were being warehoused and kind of singled out. And they couldn't believe that we chose them. And we said that you all you know, have a voice that needs to be heard. You all have sparks of passion and you have you know, these gifts that a lot of people haven't found. We're gonna help you find these and use these things. And you all have influence that we know can begin to leave a positive impact on this school and on this community. And so I go more in depth uh, with this whole story uh, with my TED talk and you can uh, check it out. But um, you know, we ended up ultimately giving these young people an opportunity where they could come up with a critical service learning project where they could identify different issues that were going on in the school community and then use all their gifts to begin to address these things in a creative way. And uh, so for them, they said, you know, we've been branded as part of the problem with this school. And what we need to do is we need to begin to rebrand ourselves in the eyes of the administration, in the eyes of the staff, even our own community, right? So they decided to take an old talent show that was kind of, you know, getting whack according to them every year at the end of the school year. And they were going to lead revitalizing this thing. So it became a platform for them to you know, share their poetry, to do some dances, to allow their peers to also express themselves. And you know, they ended up performing for both the school and parents and so forth. So we looked at the data after all this uh, transpired because we're in an age where it seemed like if you ain't got no data, what you're doing don't matter. So fortunately we were collecting some of the data and we found that attendance for this population had gone up, behavior issues had gone down, and that overall GPA, cumulative GPA had gone up a full point in our 10 weeks working with these youth, right? So we brought this to the superintendent. He said, you know, we gotta, we gotta make a town hall meeting about this. We need to bring all the principals from the entire district who are teaching secondary ed to hear what's going on. So, you know, we showed our cute little PowerPoints, but the youth heard that this town hall was gonna be in their school and they wanted to chime in. So at the end, one of the kids said, can I say something? I'm like, sure. He said, well, all I can tell you is that my brother is in the gang and I was gonna join that gang, but I'm not gonna do that anymore because I realized that I wanna be a sound engineer. And then my dream is to go to this technical college and in order to do that, I have to finish high school. So I'm not joining the gang because I got a dream. Another young man said, yeah, you know, uh, a lot of people know me for fighting and stuff like that, but I don't do that anymore. 
because I realize that I want to leave a positive legacy in the school community. And I want people to know that the Johnsons are about making a difference. Another young man, he's like, well, man, they're getting, they getting open, so I'm going to get open. Man, I used to smoke weed every single day. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what is he going to say? I used to smoke weed every day, but I don't do that. I didn't even know this, right? And so by now, the chief of staff is like, okay, is this for real? So she starts probing him a little bit. She's like, well, what's different now? He's like, well, I feel like, like I got hope now. And she says, well, what, what kind of hope is this? Like a hope, you know, you have uh, one day and then you wake up tomorrow and it's gone. He said, lady, this is a hope I'm gonna have for the rest of my life. And so these young folks, many of whom went on to being on the honor roll, ended up disrupting this narrative about these youth who didn't wanna be at school, who couldn't learn. And so pretty soon we had teachers coming to us and asking us to do a professional development with our pedagogy. Now, I came from, you know, working with these kids on the block. I didn't know what pedagogy was, you know? I thought maybe if you're out in the back alley somewhere not watching where you're stepping, you might step in some pedagogy. <laughs> hey man, give me that stick right there. I'm gonna get this pedagogy off my foot. So we just, we ended up doing the PD, but it just was like very, very practical and very raw, right? And it's like, look, here, here is how I got engaged, right? Here's, here's how we need to flip the script and not just see the stone, but see the sculpture inside of the stone. And shortly after that, the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, asked us to teach the first ever spoken word and hip hop in the classroom um, class during the summer. And so we learned pretty, pretty quickly that if we were to work with youth, we could impact a lot of lives. But if we could work with educators, that we could possibly impact a generation. And so that got me fired up intrinsically enough to want to go to grad school, to learn that pedagogy was not something that, you know, you could step in and, but something that, you know, describes the way that you engage your students, your philosophy of teaching and learning. And I began learning this language that, well, wait a minute, what we're doing, this is social emotional learning. What we're doing, this is a culturally relevant asset-based approach that's bringing an equitable lens that's connecting what's happening in the classroom to the community. And now I started to gain that language, right? And so pretty soon um, I started realizing that SEL was a big part of what we were doing. And we connected with Castle. I started doing my graduate work in Chicago and Castle uh, was doing a lot of work in different districts, uh, the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. So they would send us into the schools and districts where their traditional approaches weren't working. And we were seeing some powerful outcomes. We were seeing youth, you know, this is youth who would be deemed tier three, level five infraction, who are attending school about 55% of the time, would start attending school 96% of the time. Um, alternative schools where kids had to be kicked out of two other schools to be invited in after using our pedagogy the whole school we did training for everybody including the custodians they had their first ever 100 percent graduation rate and we started publishing different peer review academic journal articles talking about how sel can connect with cultural relevance and social justice youth development and so one of the things, one of the observations that we found is that the youth who were deemed the tier three level five infraction, who probably had the, the highest A score to us became our favorite population to work with. If we could create an environment that was safe for them, if we could create a space where they could be engaged in a culturally relevant way, if they could begin to develop some critical analysis about what's happening in their community, these young folks bring in this fire of emotional distress could begin to use this fire, not just for destruction, but for construction, right? And, uh, you know, I just want to quickly say that, you know, we hear a lot in the media about youth rebellion and resistance. And we, we hear that term rebellion in youth, and we oftentimes think, oh, looting, or, you know, they're going to smoke weed, or they're going to go burn up a car. But we got to remember that that fire, that element of fire can also bring healing. It, 
it warms our homes here in the Midwest, right? You know, if you ever see someone constructing a big building, they're, they're using fire to weld, right? And I don't know about you all or the cooking in, in New Zealand, but you know, some of our people can use that fire to cook a meal that could heal you, right? And so what we began to realize is that the pain could be converted into a propane or a fuel that could transform the school more quickly than uh, other levers and other thermostats, right? And so the other thing that we noticed was, you know, usually within five years, we would see that teachers would leave the school and go to a different school or the leaders of the school would take that data that we collected and they go get some big shot job. And that the sustainability of these programs for the tier three students um, didn't last usually beyond five years. And so for me, trauma informed in this literature and this community became a way of realizing that we need to make a paradigm shift from not just doing programs, although programs can be important, to understanding how do we impact the culture of a space? How do we work to create systemic change? And how do we look at different institutions working together and creating an ecosystem that allows for these youth to have post-traumatic growth. Have you all heard the term post-traumatic growth before? Yeah, so post-traumatic growth is similar to resilience in that they're both concerned about someone having a setback. Resilience is about bouncing back to baseline, whereas post-traumatic growth is the phenomenon by which people grow from that adversity or that trauma, right? They typically experience closer relationships a heightened sense of empowerment and a clarity of purpose. And so one of the questions, and sometimes, you know, asking questions can be dangerous. How many of us know that? When we start asking this question of what are some of the best examples in the world of districts and schools and communities that have created a context or an ecosystem of post-traumatic growth where all young people can thrive. So we've really been on this uh, global scan, doing a series of documentary films and, and case studies. I was supposed to be in South Africa a few months ago. I was bummed that I wasn't able to go because of COVID, but we have been you know, doing some digital ethnography and we did make it to some sites. And so I guess I just wanna share a couple uh, preliminary findings, if that's okay. Thumbs up if that's okay. So the work of Dr. Peter Benson uh, my beloved uh, mentor who passed, who used to work with the Search Institute, he put out a framework uh, just before he passed that I think is very relevant. And in it, he talks about, they went from 40 developmental assets to eight categories to three things. You know, to me, it's a little more helpful to have three things versus 40 things that you gotta memorize. He says they could boil it down to three essential elements that young people need in order to thrive particularly adolescents. They need to have relationships with adults other than parents. They call them these positive developmental relationships, right? And this is really important to folks in the trauma world, right? We know that healthy relationships, very critical, um, especially someone who can, you know, push them to taking positive risk. Relationship, that they need to know that they have a spark, that every young person has a spark of passion, something that they're good at, something that they can use to make a contribution to the world. And the third thing that young people need in order to thrive according to search research is that they need to know that they have a voice, that they can contribute to the things that matter to them, right? So when they look at these three things, using you know, large samples of data representative of the demographics of youth around the nation, they find that young people with these three things are doing better academically, socially, emotionally, uh, by way of behavior, psychological well-being, and so forth. But when they come to the conclusion of how many young people in this huge sample are thriving, they conclude that only 7% of youth have these three things. And so what I wanna just kind of posit here and just sort of share are a couple ideas in how these three things can become operationalized in our schools, in our own practice, so that we can create a context 
where all young people can thrive. So here we go. So yes, relationships are really important, but we need to have relationships where these elders can see that racism is, is still alive and well in the United States and it's impacting our youth, not just our youth of color, but even our white youth are being impacted, right? And beyond seeing these different systems and injustices, there needs to be some effort in the, in the elders, in the adults, and being able to see the beauty and the brilliance in our young people. Part of it is, is seeing it. The other part is creating experiences where these young people can see that beauty and brilliance for themselves. So helping to cultivate identity is of the utmost importance, a strong racial, cultural, ethnic identity but we can't give something to someone that we ourselves don't have. And so that requires that we do some work as well, reflecting on our own cultural identities, our own backgrounds, our own stories of our own families, and really dig in deep. How do we operationalize the spark? We have to realize that young folks have these cultural assets, not only in their lives, but also in their communities. We have to cultivate our capability of seeing these assets. Uh, there's a researcher named Tara Yoso, and she calls it community cultural wealth, right? Wealth is not just financial. There's at least seven other forms of wealth. Can we see that? And how do we not just see that, but how do we see these practices already being used in nurturing well-being, nurturing the minds, the bodies, the hearts, and the spirit? And how do we connect that to some of the practices, rituals, rhythms of our schools and organizations? Without going into it too much, self-actualization, realizing that your spark, the highest uh, expression of one spark is being able to use that spark to go serve and to help somebody else, right? I won't go into it too much, but we found out in our research that Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, he talks about the importance of physical, psychological safety, right? But we found out he got this model from the Blackfoot Indians in Alberta, Canada. And according to the original model, he gets it wrong because in the Blackfoot Indian model, their first phase, because in his model, the last phase is self-actualization, in their, in their teepee, they don't use the pyramid, their first phase is self-actualization, right? Because using that collectivist community mindset, it's like, if you are part of this community, we got you. And it's our job to make sure that you know you have a purpose. You're gonna find that spark and you're gonna use that to serve the world. Because the next phase for them is community actualization, right? And so this kind of leads me to the whole youth voice piece that you know, it's young people finding their voice and eventually being able to add that single voice to a chorus of voices with other elders and other people in their community because our communities also have a purpose, right? And, and just as Laura was saying, you know, earlier when she heard, you know, something that made their heart sing, you know, sometimes that can happen on a collective level. And so youth voice also requires authentic youth leadership and empowerment, uh, not just you know, symbolic, uh, not, not just limited, but fully allowing young people to be involved in co-creating policies and, and plans and programs. And also looking at cultural sustainability and using everything that they've learned about their past, everything about their history and feeling empowered that they can remix that knowledge and that experience to solve the problems of today, because problems are always evolving and our solutions always need to evolve as well. So with that, I know I've kind of said a mouthful. <laughs> I'll pause, see if uh, we got some questions and we can kind of go from there. But thank you for letting me share. Oh, thank you so much. You guys can see why every time Roberto and I get on a chat it's like two hours later we're like oh my god our meeting was an hour and now we're just <laughs> we just go off right um and i know i i've talked with you before about my experience um i went to 
one of the first high schools in the country named after Malcolm X in Madison of all places, right? And the, it was started in 1971 by a bunch of radical hippie teachers. And Roberto is very familiar with Shabazz. And it's interesting because this concept, all of the things that he talked about are what builds that school and their mission and their structure. And you're steeped in that. I didn't know that as a kid, but this is what, how I went to high school with this framework from teachers who believed everything that he's saying very deeply. And I didn't realize till I was an adult how much this transformed my life and why I became a teacher in an alternative high school, right? Because then this is where we were allowed to have a lot of freedom to do this work. Mm -hmm. And it's always been one of my goals to try to figure out how we take those lessons, that paradigm shift, that mindset, mm -hmm. and use that knowledge to uplift all kids in all of our schools, you know, not just in like, because I think Roberto found this work with kids who were, you know, marginalized or pushed aside or warehoused, like is the case for a lot of alternative high schools. And so, but we know that this is what all of us need, like Adriana said, this isn't just for kids who are struggling, right? We all need those things um, to thrive. And so how do we take I want us to think, you know, how do we take all of this wonderful conversation and think about how do we transform our districts, our schools, um, to really incorporate this message? I mean, I think that's our challenge. So I would love to hear from you guys, kind of like what's bubbling up for you? What are you thinking? Do you have questions for Roberto? Um, you can raise your hand, Jenica, and unmute you. Let's have a discussion. Adriana, this is how wildfires start. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I love it. And I know it takes a minute to marinate on our thoughts here. Jody, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share with the group if we could unmute you. I'd love to hear. Would that be okay? Where is she? Jody, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you if that's okay. Yep, yeah, she's, Jenna will do it for you. You should be unmuted now. Right. Um, yeah, we um, last summer got a group of teens and their teachers together from a middle school and high school to really think about what was failing with social emotional learning. And it was really because the teachers were teaching too. And so we set up a format for the teens to lead and co-design curriculum. And it was really exciting. And there were a couple profound shifts that happened. First is we, we centered it around community building so that we started every day creating community around among the six teachers and six teens. And the teachers um, were shocked about what community felt like and acknowledge that even like in their own advisory, sometimes they didn't, the students didn't all know each other's names. Mm -hmm. So they left with a sense of, I have community is more important than I ever dreamed of. And they also left with a sense of how much better it can be when they share power with teens. Mm -hmm. And then of course they went back to their systems. Um, and even though the systems quote listened, they didn't really make change. And so this year we're doing it again with really intentional, um, obviously virtually this year, because Seattle's a hot spot, um, with really intentional change about, uh, around social justice and how social justice can't be an add-on to the curriculum. It has to be woven into the curriculum. And in particular, the adults need to do their work and so how do adults do parallel work with the students and what can we provide for the adults? So we've been working with a team of these students and um, adults for the year. And we will reconvene with a new, you know, adding new teachers and new students. But it, what, I, what, what surprised me the most was um, how dramatically it changed the adults that it really shifted their perspective. They are now advocates for this as opposed to uh, passive bystanders. And 
they have, in subtle ways, the couple of them in their position in school have totally shifted how students are treated and how um, when kids make mistakes, how they're treated and taught instead of treated and excluded. And um, it's dramatically reduced fights in the high school, um, or it did until COVID happened. <laughs> and it lifted out skill building and, um, I mean, it's really quite thrilling. Um, we'll see what happens. Awesome. Um, Thank you. That's really yeah. great to hear. I love it. Thank you, Jody. Yeah. Roberto, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's several things that stood out. Jody, thank you for sharing. First of all, um, I love how you kind of made a distinction between, you know, teaching to to teaching with, you know what right. I mean? Uh, I see some of the beautiful art in the background and I'm reminded of a, a quote from a native uh, elder who says, you know, if you've come to help me, you are wasting your time. Right. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, let us journey together. Right. And I think one of, you know, the ways that I like to apply that to our work with youth or folks who are marginalized in general is uh, a couple of things. One is that folks, you know, it's inauthentic if we act like we have everything all figured out ourselves, right? <laughs> but if we're willing to do the self work, if we're willing to be open and honest and vulnerable and include young people on that journey, well, they're, they're willing to go there. They're willing to be there, right? Uh, and, and I think that this is, gets to the, some of the sweet spot of why a lot of us got into this profession of education and working with youth was to build these meaningful relationships, was to engage in deeper learning, and ultimately not just to prepare young people for solving problems on a test, but really to begin to start solving problems in their lives and in the world around them. So to me, and I've been talking to my SEL colleagues, SEL, social emotional learning, is really at a crossroads. And I would say trauma-informed is also at a crossroads right now with uh, all the civil unrest and what's been happening with rem remote learning and COVID and so forth. And so one path is just to keep going back to the normal way of doing things, the status quo. And, you know, we, we keep doing this programming to our youth, uh, which ultimately uh, we're trying to get them to assimilate or to acculturate into white Eurocentric ways of being and seeing the world um, where young folks feel like they have to do what uh, Dr. An Angela Valenzuela talks about as subtractive schooling, that uh, the more that they feel like they need to um, do well academically and conform, they start divorcing themselves from their racial, cultural, and ethnic identities. And this actually is a form of trauma, right? And so we get into the situation of what Ingrid was talking about last week, where, you know, you can conform and navigate through all these systems and get your master's and PhD, but, you know, are you really uh, thriving? Are you really, uh, you know, self-actualized? Or are you just conforming and, and therefore internalizing some of this trauma? The other route is a route of real transformation. And that's one where, you know, teachers realize that, look, you know, this, this work, we're going to do it with one another. We're going to work on our identity and we're going to support you in developing a healthy cultural, uh, ethnic, racial identity. Uh, in the process of us being in real relationship, we're going to both develop a multicultural competence where we're fluent in our own culture, but also in at least one other culture, right? And that really the goal is that young folks start to be engaged on an intrinsic level where they start asking that question, okay, how can I take what I'm learning and apply it to benefit uh, my own empowerment and the empowerment and transformation of my community. And that's really where learning starts taking off. And I think the opportunity that we see here with COVID and everything that's happening is that, you know, young folks are gonna be turned off real quick if we hit them with another packet. But if we take the, the posture of becoming a student of our students, of asking them, what are they passionate about? What are some of the issues going on in the community? And we start connecting, um, even if it be math or English or history or some of this programming to real things going on in the community, 
we're going to see the highest level of engagement that we've ever seen. And we're right at the precipice of this. Um, but again, it takes what Jody said, sharing power, letting young people chime in, share their voice and their ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me just share this piece. We have to remember too that every successful social movement in the last 50 years has always had youth presence and youth voice be a part of it. You know, sometimes history gets a little whitewashed, but if you look at civil rights, it's not just Dr. King and Rosa Parks, it's young people who are boarding buses and going down south and sitting at lunch counters and demanding to be fed. It's young people going on these marches and being sprayed with water hoses, right? They were the heart and soul of the civil rights movement. Or if we look at some of the work that's happened in Brazil and how they were cutting a lot of social services, it was the elders and the youth who worked together to get the Brazilian Congress to adopt the United Nations rights of a child. Once they adopted that, they were able to use that to say, look, you're in violation of this by making all of these budget cuts. How many of us have ever experienced budget cuts before? Or even in South Africa, it was the youth working with elders who challenged the status quo of the Bantu system of education, which was part of them taking down apartheid, right? And I really truly believe that we are seeing a great awakening that's unprecedented of young people realizing they have a voice, realizing that they can make a difference. We need our elders to lock arms with them and schools are a very important site for this radical transformation that we all have been hungry to see and I think is closer than ever before. Absolutely. And I love, I mean, there's just so much great stuff going on in the chat and with what you're saying, the threads, I mean, community is the root of this and belonging, right? As we can keep weaving these framework of trauma-informed approach, right, through goes through all of this, that sense of belonging community is what keeps them coming to school, going to school, that sense of belonging and purpose. How do we create, you know, we create that by empowering them to have a voice. And I, I just don't even want to drop what came up between both Jody and Adriana and from you that the adults need to do the work alongside of them and be vulnerable. And I find this every time I work with school, with schools, most on uh, 90% of my work is with teachers, right? And getting them to do their own work, not there to, you know, fix kids or change kids behavior or do another program, right? But it's really that deep work with ourselves. And it's, it's Ingrid said that last week when she was talking about, you know, race and racism, right? And youth, all of this starts with us alongside with them and giving them opportunities to have a voice. I was sharing with Roberto when we were talking the other day about some schools here in Los Angeles that have self-actualization as their mission. And this is a public high school, right? Our words matter. What we say that we're committed to matters. And that is their goal in their mission statement, that kids become self-actualized. And they give these kids assignments like go out and walk around your community and map Where's the grocery store? Where's the weed store? Where's the liquor store? Where's the check cashing place? Where's the actual bank? And they have them actually map their entire neighborhood and they look at the discrepancies of where those things lie. And then they make an analysis of this. These are like ninth graders, right? They can do this work. We can give them, and they're excited about that kind of work. That gets them excited about learning. So how do we incorporate that even in this new digital context, right? It is possible to do this work without a packet, I do believe. We just have to be very creative and use each other as resources. Um, what other thoughts are coming up? <laughs> so many. <laughs> I let, and remember, you guys can save the chat, okay? Because there's just so much going on that's so rich. Can I just share something real yes, quick here? Yes, of course. Uh, because it's always, you know, folks who have to teach math are like, this sounds great in theory, but how the heck do, would you even like teach math with youth voice? Well, one of our colleagues in Chicago, you know, that we trained up in becoming a student of our students um, said, okay, look, I got to teach high level math to these kids on the west side of Chicago. It's kind of the hood, but I'm going to just 
try to get a sense of what's going on with him socially, emotionally, what's happening in the community. Long story short, he comes to find out, this was a few years back, a lot of the youth, family members, and neighbors are losing their homes through this whole subprime mortgage crisis, right? So he connects this math teacher with other educators who are teaching math, and they're like, let's do an experiment. Let's see if we can teach this math in the context of the subprime balloon interest rates mortgages and see what can happen. So they start developing a few lessons. He comes back, you know, this is a white guy from Wisconsin uh, who's teaching in inner city Chicago. He's got his fist with a ruler in it and says math is power. And he's very <laughs> excited to share these lessons. He says, look, I'm going to help you understand this process of why people are losing their homes. I'm going to help you understand how to even possibly stop it but it's gonna all be through math. Well, what do you think happened? Are these kids engaged more or less? They start coming early. They start staying late. Uh, pretty soon they say, hey, uh, Mr. Cry, uh, you know, we've been talking. We're gonna do a community forum with our parents and with the neighborhood, and we're gonna share this information. We can't keep it to ourselves. He said, look, I'm gonna support you, but you guys gotta take the lead, right? One of the kids comes up with the speech, another one designs the PowerPoint, another one does the flyer, another one gets the venue. They end up having the whole community there and they're sharing in English and in Spanish what is going on and breaking it down. Turns out people leave the meeting, folks who are on the verge of losing their homes, and now they have the knowledge to not lose their homes, right? These young people become champions for their community. And yes, at the end of the day, they end up having to take a standardized test and they knock it out of the park, right? But that was never the focus, that was never the point. The point was them becoming these agents of change in the community, right? And I think one of the things with COVID is it's amplifying a lot of um, the inequities, a lot of the holes in the ecosystems of our communities. And what if we could center youth voice in a place where we said, okay, look, you know, you guys let us know what you need to build up your ecosystem and we'll teach you math. We'll teach you English and history together in this kind of collaborative way so that you can begin to build up this ecosystem and really serve your community. It could be transformative. I love it. Just so many snaps. <laughs> um, we have to, let me check time really quick. All right, we have about 10 minutes. So any other questions that you want us to spin off on and get excited about? You can either raise your hand or put it in the chat um, and we can unmute you. You just have to let us know. Adriana, I know it's early, but <laughs> do you want us to unmute you? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> She's in New Zealand, Roberto, so she, it's tomorrow morning for her. All right, Jenna, can you unmute Adriana? But me that's unmuting. Can you hear uh, me? Yes. I was just thinking, you know, about what Roberto is saying, and there is just so, it's so important to value the community, the history of the community, because um, like in New Zealand, we have different um, iwis, which are tribes in New Zealand, and we've all got um, a Treaty of Waitangi that we, um, that we look towards, which was our founding document. And we've always looked at history from the Euro European perspective, but actually, there's two people in New Zealand that signed the treaty. There's the Māori people and there's the, the Crown, you know, the Europeans. And um, the, voice, the voice of the people, like the tribes, have been negated by the European perspective. But actually the, the iwi, the Māori people, have a very strong, important... Um, knowledge that needs to be shared and it is you know it's coming to the fore now because we're pushing for it 
um, but it took a long time to get there. And so you need to look towards your community so you understand your community because that's where you work in. You participate in your community. If you get a strong community network, then you aren't isolated in that. So I think, you know, what Roberto is saying is so very important is to value, but you have to value them. And if you don't, you know, before, um, before Māori started going up in arms about the history, we just learnt about the European. But now that people are starting to say, hey, listen to our, our voice, they're starting, we're coming to rising to the fore and people are actually starting, are really interested in that. Yeah, good one. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you as always. <laughs> I think uh, there's some really good points there. And, you know, it just so happens, Adriana, that one of the sites that we've been learning from is in New Zealand. So we've been uh, connected with Kia Ora College uh, just out in, outside of Auckland. And so we've been connecting with Ann Milne and, and her daughter Haley. Uh, just so y'all know, uh, these folks are doing amazing work. Uh, I think it's some of the best examples of, of trauma-informed post-traumatic growth that's putting equity and self-determination at the center. Um, and she just wrote a book. It's phenomenal. It's called Coloring in the White Spaces. And a lot of people in New Zealand are reading it. But I think it's very relevant to, you know, what's happening here in the States for a number of reasons. But to your point, Adriana, is uh, I was talking with Ann Milne, the, the founder of the school, and she just said, you know, does our school have any responsibility to the neighborhood and community that we're in? She says, does our school have any responsibility to the families that don't have students that go here that are not formally connected? And her response to these questions was, absolutely. She says, the reason our school exists is to serve our local community. And so a lot of the bedrock of this school is that they have defined and redefined success, not just from the Ministry of Education in New Zealand, but with the Maori, the Pacifica, the Samoan communities. And so it, they go to your point, Laura, um, their mission statement is co-created with the families and with the youth. And so it's not just a mission that everyone is, is bought into now, now that connects to the rubrics that the teachers are using in their development of lesson plans, right? And so I think a big opportunity in this moment is a deep reset to shift from just schooling our kids to educating our kids. One of the goals that they have at Kiowata College is they want their young folks to become warrior scholars. They want them to be able to think critically and work collaboratively, to advocate for their school community, to get the funding that they need, to get the support that they need so that they can thrive. And what if we could work with our schools in getting youth and family voice involved, not just in the periphery and, you know, SEL and, and math curriculums are great, but what if they could have a seat at the table and redefining what does it mean to be educated in this space and to start holding folks accountable to delivering on what is co-created with this community. And Absolutely. One of the things that I want to share that you might all be shocked by <laughs> is that the state of Kansas did this work with this, from the state level driven by their state superintendent. And they went to all the communities and they said, what do you want from school? What do you want kids to come out with on the other side? What does it mean for you to be, and they asked everybody, chambers of commerce, focus groups, parents, everybody, right? I know, Kansas, I was, their state superintendent is so progressive and so amazing. And so he did, he led this and they went to all the communities and asked, what do you want? And it was this very long process and they came up with this very detailed response of what community expects and wants and hopes for their kids. And then they gave grants to schools to actually redesign their entire schools. And it was made up with parents and teachers and community members and they were allowed to have a ton of freedom. Redesign your bell schedule, your curriculum, who goes, like everything, right? 
Yeah, Dr. Randy Watson. And I, when I learned about this from working in Kansas, I, it blew my mind because it takes a lot of this idea and is not only leading it, but supporting it financially and giving them the freedom to do so. And so I'm always trying to like share it. Like there are some models out there where they've, <laughs> they have um, started doing this work at kind of a big systems level. Yeah, that's what, that's what it made me think of is that. Thank that you very idea. much. I, I want to check out that work from Dr. Randy Watson too. Yeah. So I've, I've written that down. Let Who's me just, that? I want to share one little thing. And I was of talking course. to my colleague, Dr. Uh, Dakota Irby, who's a professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago yesterday, and he's working on a book. And uh, his book has been doing really deep work in a suburban high school uh, for the better part of seven years. And one of the comments that he made is that, uh, you know, far too often our funding structures are such that we'll, you know, do some efforts uh, around equity, but, you know, over a relatively short amount of time, maybe it's one year, two years, if we're lucky, maybe three years. He said from his research, both in the school that he's writing a book about and in other places, it takes five to seven years to see the real fruit of yeah. this transformation occur. So I just want to encourage, you know, the community that's here is like, you know, sometimes we get in this capitalistic mindset, we try something for one or two, three years. And if we don't see the data right away, we think, well, it's not working. And from his research, you know, working with these folks, they, they said, look, at first, I didn't want to do this. I didn't know what you're talking about. Uh, white, you know, fragility and bias. I hated it. But after a while, folks started getting it and they started you know, getting on board. And so just be encouraged. This stuff takes time, it takes effort, but in the end it is fruitful and it, and it can be transformative. Ah, I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Never forget that this is a marathon. All of this work is not, can't be done with a book club or a one-off, you know, PD or the quick work. This is five to seven years, big transformational shift, deep work. Some of the resources that Jody mentioned are my absolute go-tos, Peter Senge and William Bridges and Michael Fuller. And, and they're all talking about this deep systems change work that takes a long time. And it can't, it, and, it be, and for me, this is what resonates so much about the trauma-informed framework, right? That we cannot do this big, deep work without trust, transparency, safety, you know, psychological safety, adults being able to connect together in a safe space. Um, and we need leaders who can help us do that as well. We can't forget about that and not let that stop us. So I don't want to go, but it is now time to go. Um, as always, this goes so quickly, so quickly. And I can't thank you enough, Roberto, for coming and sharing with us. It's been so wonderful. I love hearing you talk and um, I think everyone else enjoyed it immensely. Um, don't forget to save the chat, right? So much stuff in there, I save it. And if you somehow save it and lose it, let us know, Jenna and I can get it to you. Um, and Roberto, any last words? Uh, it's a good question. First of all, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to connect and to converse. Uh, my heart is singing as a result. And I just want to, again, uh, encourage you all uh, to keep on keeping on. Um, I guess a quote comes to mind. I'm a quote guy. And Dr. King, you know, once said, you know, society will oftentimes try to convince you that you're a thermometer, but remember, you're not a thermometer. You are a thermostat, right? And so right now, I think it's uh, time. If it's ever been time, it is time right now to turn up, to turn out, to transform the cultures and the climates of our school communities, and to do it with our youth and with the families that we have proximity to. Those who are most proximate to the problem are most proximate to the solution. So thank you again. Absolutely. Love it. All right, everybody. See you next week. Thank you so much. Have a great week. Yeah, pleasure. <laughs> and if you want to reach out, Laura can give you my information. Yes, absolutely. I can share that. Thank you. Bye. Bye.